Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. We welcome every one of you. We welcome our, our visitors. We're glad to have you. May the Lord bless you. We appreciate you coming this way today. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in Athens, Georgia, of the Northside Baptist Church. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. If you get on the phone, call a friend, have them to tune in and get this broadcast during the next hour. It'll be a blessing to them. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn, would you please, to Genesis chapter 17, chapter 18, and chapter 21. Reading, first of all, from Genesis chapter 17. I'm speaking today on this subject, the laughing one. I'll tell you what I mean by that when I read the scriptures. And this is tape number 218. Tape number 218. The laughing one. You can write in and get these cassette tape. I have more than 200 listed. Tape number 217. The woman who eavesdropped on her husband and laughed at what she heard. That was last Sunday. Then tape number 216. Tongues and the charismatic movement. I might mention also I'm taking up. I'm bringing a series of messages starting tomorrow on the tongues and the charismatic movement on the daily broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon. You'll take your Bible and follow me in the Word of God will help you in this respect. One of the most dangerous movements in the land today is the charismatic movement. And we'll tell you why, give you chapter and verse. And if you'll follow me beginning tomorrow at noon as we lay the foundation for the messages, We'll try to help you. Now, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. This is a faith ministry of workers together in getting out the gospel. God gave the word. Great is a company of those that publish it. We get our calls quite often from people saying, Preacher Edwards, your broadcast means very much to us. People calling in requesting prayer. And we thank God for this great ministry. Now in my 38th year of daily broadcasting, we appreciate everything that's been accomplished. 38 years of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia in our 38th year now. And it's not a fly-by-night ministry. And we appreciate you that make it possible. Turn with you please to Genesis chapter 17 for the first scripture. I'm reading verses 15 through 19. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall her name be. Now I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then notice what happened. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and shall call his name Isaac. Now establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. Now turn to uh, chapter uh, 18 and look at verse 12 chapter 18 just turn the page over and look at verse 12 I read this scripture last Sunday then Sarah laughed within herself saying after I'm wax old shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also so she laughed at the same thing that Abraham laughed about now turn would you please to chapter 21 chapter 21 we begin with um, uh, verse 1 and read through verse 8. This is the book of Genesis, of course. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him. Whom Sarah bare to him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old. As God commanded him. 
And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck by born him a son in his old age? And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now the name Isaac means laughter, or it means the laughing one. So they named him laughter or the laughing one because they laughed at what God said about it. And Sarah said, other people will laugh when they find out I'm going to give birth to a child at the age of 90. And she said, they'll laugh at me, they'll laugh about it. And so when that child was born, they named him laughter. And they called him the laughing one. That is what is meant by the name Isaac. Now Isaac outlived all the old patriarchs. He lived a long time upon the earth. God blessed him and God used him. And I want to say a few things about him today and encourage you as you sojourn for God. I want you to notice first of all this laughing one as a lad. Now he believed with his father that God would provide himself a lamb. In the book of Genesis chapter 22 and verse 8, And Abraham said, my son, God would provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And they went both of them together. Now you remember the story as they traveled up the mountain, Mount Moriah. On the way up, Isaac had the wood on his shoulders. There, there were two men left down at the foot of the hill, which is the type of the two thieves on the cross. And then Isaac going up Mount Moriah had the wood on his back. It's a type of Jesus carrying his cross to Gargarth's hill. And then Abraham going along with him is a type of God the Father. As it traveled up the hill on one side, on the other side, no doubt, there came a little ram coming up on the hill. On Maybe you don't have a job. Maybe there's problems in your home. Maybe there's things that's come along that disturb you. Remember, there could be a little lamb coming up on the other side of the hill. So you just move on up the hill as God wants you to. When you get to the top, God will take care of the situation. Now he believed along with his father. The Bible said, and both of them went together. Now he said to his dad, we have the fire, we have the wood, we have the knife. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, son, God would provide himself a lamb. And so God became that lamb. Jesus Christ himself became the lamb. God would provide himself a lamb. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, that great Baptist preacher stood there by the river of Jordan. He saw a man coming toward him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. God provided himself a lamb. Let's notice a little something about this lamb even in the Old Testament. We find first of all the lamb typified in what happened there uh, between uh, Abel and God. Abel carrying the fat of the lamb to the altar that a worship God. And there when Abel killed that little lamb, shed his blood and carried the offering and put it on the altar, that is the lamb typified. That's a type of Jesus Christ becoming our lamb on Calvary's cross. So you have here then the lamb typified in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4. Then secondly, you have the lamb prophesied. I referred to that a moment ago here in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 8. You have the lamb prophesied because Abraham, who is a type of God the Father, said to Isaac, who is a type of the Son, he said, God will provide himself a lamb. So you have him prophesied. Then they can look forward to the time when God would provide that lamb. And in due time, on scheduled time, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, In the fullness of time, there he was born of a woman. There Jesus Christ came into the world, God providing himself a lamb. But that was prophesied many times in the Old Testament, in particular here in the Genesis uh, chapter uh, 22 and verse 8. There he was uh, prophesied. Then we find the lamb also being applied. 
Not only was he typified and prophesied, but he was applied. If you read the Bible in Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 and 13, you'll find these words. And they shall take unto them a lamb, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Here you have the lamb applied. Now Moses in the land of Egypt contending with Pharaoh. And God said, now Moses, I'm going to give Pharaoh one more chance. I want you to go and you tell the fathers of the land of Egypt, the Hebrew fathers, to take a little lamb and there take the blood from its little body and you place that blood in a basin. And then you take some hyssop and dip that hyssop in that blood. And then he said, I want you to apply that blood. You apply it on the doorpost on either side of the door, the doorpost and the upper lintel. That forming a cross, the blood from the hands of Jesus and from his forehead. And there they applied the lamb. They applied the blood of the lamb in the land of Egypt. God said, I will come through tonight with the death angel. As they destroy you, brother. I'm coming through with the destroyer. And he said, in every house where I find that blood, I'll pass over that house. But he said, if the blood is not there, the firstborn in that house must die from the palace of Pharaoh down to the, the uh, oldest animal there in the kingdom. And so we find that they had to get behind that blood. He said, now you tell the families, you tell the fathers that they must get behind that door. When you put the blood on the doorpost and up a lintel, then get in that house and shut that door and don't come out. I'm coming through tonight and destroy you. will check your house. He will check your door. If you don't have the blood applied, the firstborn must die. So those Hebrew fathers were very careful that none of their children went to the outside of that house that night. They watched them very closely. Then about midnight, there was a terrible cry in the land of Egypt. In every house of the Egyptians, there the firstborn in that house died. All of those parents and brothers and sisters found the oldest brother or the oldest sister dead there in the house. And there's a great mourning, weeping and wailing going up out of the land of Egypt. Why? Because there was no blood applied to their doors. Beloved, there's coming a time when God will take his people home and the people of this world will be left here to go into the tribulation period and they'll be weeping and wailing during the tribulation period and those that die and go to hell will be weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth all because the blood's not been applied. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The blood must be applied or you'll die and go to hell. You can scoff and mock and laugh and ridicule the blood. You can say we'll take the blood out of the old hymnals. We'll take the blood out of the Bible. But it's still as powerful as it ever was and always shall be. And so the blood must be applied. Then we move on another step and that is we find the Lamb personified. Not only do you find him typified in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4. Not only do you find him um, uh, they are prophesied in Genesis 22 and verse 8. Not only do you find him applied in Exodus chapter 12 verses 3 and 13, but you find him personified. You find him personified in Isaiah chapter 53 and especially verse 7. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before shear is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Here we find Isaiah, the great prophet of God, telling us what would happen when Jesus came the first time. Now he would come as a little lamb, meek and lowly, not harming anyone. Come upon the earth as a sacrificial lamb. And he tells us in Isaiah 53 and verse 7 how that would happen. Now you can study about the sheep in Israel, about the little lambs and how tender they are and and how uh, kind they are and, and how you can pet them and love them and how they love the shepherd and how they'll not harm anyone. A little sheep or a little lamb will never harm anyone. They are harmless creatures. They are harmless creatures. I've seen them many times in the Holy Land as those shepherds would lead them around 
across those hills. They're very harmless. Isaiah, the great man of God, the prophet of God, looked down through the angel of time and saw someone coming on the sea. And what he saw was a little lamb, one led as a lamb to the slaughter, one that led without opposition, without him uh, fighting back or uh, condemning them that led him to the slaughter. He was meek and lowly, and he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before a shearer is dumb, he omit not his mouth. Now they tell us you can take that little sheep and the old shepherd will bring it into himself at a certain time in the year and he'll take his shears and there he'll cut that wool off. Now that wool is on the sheep but it belongs to the shepherd. That's why he's uh, feeding those sheep and leading them from place to place. He gets the wool at a certain time of the year and that wool is carried to the market and he gets money for the wool and he uses that money to buy things he needs. Now, of course, they uh, uh, milk the, um, uh, the sheep and, um, and uh, they eat the sheep, the mutton, they eat that. But their money comes in through that wool. They take the wool, they carry it to the market, they sell the wool, they take the money, and then they can buy what they need there in town. But when that little sheep is brought before uh, that shepherd, it does open its mouth. That wool belongs to that shepherd. He raised that sheep. He fed that sheep. He guarded that sheep. protected that sheep. He took care of it when it was sick or bruised. Or had a broken bone. And now it's time for the sheep to do something for the shepherd. And it gives its wool. And the Bible said Jesus came meek and lowly as a lamb. As a sheep before the slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. When they spit in his face. When they beat him over the head, when they whipped his back, whenever they falsely accused him, he didn't open his mouth like a little sheep. He went right on to the cross and died in your place and mine. Then we come to the fifth thought, and that is we find this lamb identified. The lamb identified in John 1, 29. Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist preaching repentance and baptizing converts. Down on the river of Jordan saw Jesus coming and he said, Behold, no doubt he raised his hand and pointed, said, Behold, look, behold, here comes the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. They looked and they saw Jesus coming and the Bible said he came to take away the sin of the world. When they nailed Jesus Christ on the cross and God's wrath fell on him, he was made sin for us, he that knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. And there the sin, uh, the wrath of God fell upon Jesus who was made sin. All the sins of the whole world from Adam and Eve right on to the end of the millennium was placed on Jesus Christ on Calvary that day. And He paid the sin debt of all sin in the world there on Calvary. And He was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Someone said a man went to God one day and there he confessed his sins, asked God to forgive him. He accepted that, went on his way. A little later he came back and uh, got on his knees. He said, uh, Lord, I want to confess my same sins I confessed earlier. God said, what sins? See, when God forgives you of your sins, he doesn't remember them anymore. God said, what sins are you talking about? He confessed them early. God had blotted them out. God had forgiven him. There's no need of you confessing the same sin over and over again. If you accept God's forgiveness, they're gone. They're gone forever. They're blotted out. You don't have to come back and confess the same ones again because God forgives you. No more than you need to go down to the grocery store and pay your grocery bill twice or any other bill you might owe. If you pay for it, it's paid for it. Why go back and pay it again? And so Jesus Christ took away the sin of the world. We see another step, and that is the Lamb magnified in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, and honor, glory and blessings. Here we see the Lamb of God in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12 being magnified. Now he deserves that, of course. He should be magnified, and he was because of what he did for us. Then again, we see the Lamb glorified 
in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3, And there was no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Here we find the Lamb glorified, and he deserves to be glorified. And he is the one that will be glorified. In that day, God's already glorified him, but if we have any glory, we want to lay it at Jesus' feet. So we see here a lamb for an individual. In Genesis chapter 4, we see a lamb for a household. In Exodus chapter 12, we see a lamb for a nation. In Leviticus chapter 16, and we see the lamb for the world. In John chapter 1 and verse 29. Now I just want to mention these things about the lamb because Isaac said, Father, where is the sacrifice? God said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb, and he did. Now this man, laughter, the laughing one, time came for him to get married. He was old enough now for a wife, and his father Abraham said in Genesis 24 to Eliezer, evidently that was the name of his eldest servant, I want you to go into the land from which we came and find a bride for my son Isaac. He is now old enough to get married. And so he sent the elder servant. Abraham did. And Abraham said, you go and find this bride for Isaac. Go back to our people. We don't want him to marry among the Canaanites here in this land. We want him to go back to our people and there secure a bride for my son Isaac. And so Eliezer got his camels together and his servants and the goods that Abraham gave him to make an impression upon the bride to bees, parrots, and so forth. And they headed across the desert until they came to this certain land. And then when they came there, of course, uh, he had great faith in selecting this bride, believing that the bride would come according to God's divine will and plan. We find both members of the union should be of the like faith. God's beginning to work now on both ends of the line. He finds Isaac over here wanting a bride. And then there's Rebecca over here wanting a husband. She was of age and he was of age. They live many, many miles apart. And so now God is beginning to work. God is bringing Ezar over to the land where Rebecca lived. God is on the scene. I still contend if you love God and you want God's will done in your life, and you're not married, if you seek the face of God, I believe in due time, in due time, if you won't run ahead of God, that God will bring to you the one he wants you to have. I believe that with all of my heart, both husband or wife, God can work in both directions. We have too many people today that run ahead of God, get out of God's will, and say, well, I'll just go ahead and get married if it doesn't work out. Then I'll get me divorced right quick and I'll find someone else. Well, that's not what God wants it to be from the beginning. Now, in Genesis chapter 24, verses 2 through 4, if you will read that, you'll find how Abraham sent to get a wife for this laughing one, Isaac. And the choice should be made only in earnest and after much deliberate prayer. In Genesis chapter 24 and verse 12, he said, O Lord God, my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed today and show kindness unto my master Abraham. We find the elder one in Abraham's house, Eliezer, on the way over this particular land. He's praying. He says, I have a mission to perform. He says, oh God, don't let me fail. I want to bring the right one back for Isaac. My master Abraham is depending on me. And I want you to lead me to the woman that you want to be Isaac's wife, the laughing one's wife. Now we notice that courtesy and industrious are important in the qualification of a life of a partner. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 24, 18 and 19, and after the elder, the servant came over and came into this land, he was there at this particular well, and here comes a beautiful woman down to this well. And she saw this man standing there, and she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hastened and let down her pitcher upon her hand, and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. 
Now here is Rebecca. Rebecca is not a lazy woman. She had been taught by her mother to work with her hands, help keep the house, to do what needs to be done. Now she comes out, she sees this stranger, and she sir, said, Sir, I'll draw you some water. And she threw him some water, and she said, Sir, I'll draw you some water for your camels also. A man that's got a wife that's not too lazy to keep house and not too lazy to work is fortunate. But a man that's got a sorry, lazy wife, they won't keep a house like she should, too lazy to work and do what she could, should and care for her children. Brother, he's in bad shape. Now, if you have a wife that'll work and labor and help you and care for the children, do what she needs to do, you're fortunate. Thank God for women that don't mind doing that. And so she was willing to help out in this respect. Now there must be a complete freedom of choice. In verse 24 and verse 58, they call Rebecca and said unto her, Will thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Now they asked her, after they found out what he wanted, uh, her parents asked her, Will you go with this man back to Abraham's tent many miles away and marry his son Isaac? They asked her, would she be willing to go? Now, what did she say? She said, I will go. She was willing. When God brings a couple together, be united in a holy matrimony, he makes their mind willing. They're willing to marry each other. And she said, I will go. Now, back many years ago, uh, I asked my wife if she willed. And she willed it and been willing ever since. But anyway, you got to be willing to will. you got to say, I will, I'm willing, I'm willing to marry that individual. And so that if you marry somebody against their will, if they're half-hearted about it, if you can't fully make up their mind, if you don't know whether they should, you better let them alone. You better let them alone until God works that will out in both lives that they both are willing. If you don't, you'll certainly be sorry. And we notice in Genesis chapter 24 verse 16, and the damsel was very fair to look upon. That is, she was beautiful, a beautiful woman and a virgin. Neither had any man known her. Premarital chastity is a, a great asset to happy marriage. And here we find this woman here, a virgin, a very beautiful person. And the true marriage and love continued on after they married. In Genesis chapter 24 verse 67, she became his wife. And he loved her. In Genesis chapter 26 and verse 8, you find they continued in love one toward another. Many years ago, yonder the great uh, Persian uh, commander, uh, the it, it story is told of the great Persian king, the king of Persia, uh, uh, the general of Cyprus and the king of Persia. Now the king of Persia had some great generals on the battlefield. And one of the men came home, one of the generals to visit his family. And when he arrived at home, he found that his wife had been taken in and put in prison because of uh, uh, they thought that she had betrayed the country, uh, treachery she was accused of. And they brought her in and had her in prison. And when this great general uh, came up before the mighty king, he came just on the very day they were to bring his wife out and put her to death. They brought his wife before the king to sentence her to death. And the king said she must die immediately because she's betrayed this country. This great general that was greatly loved by this Persian king went before the king and fell down on his face on the ground. And he said, oh, king, sir, he said, would you please spare my wife and put me to death? I would gladly die in her place. I love her so much. I will die in her stead. Sir, would you put me to death in her stead? The old king said, no. I'll tell you what. You've been a great general. And you love your wife so much. I'm going to let her go free. And you can both walk away free people. They got up and started away. And this great general said to his wife. He said, did you see the face of that great king? And the kind of expression on his face. When he said that we could go free or you could go free, she said, no, sir. He said, I could only see the face of the man that was willing to give his life that I might live. 
And that's the way it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that gave his life that we might live. It's his face we should behold and always remember that. And so they were very happy and they continued in love according to the Bible. Later on in life you find that this man Isaac, when he was growing old, how he called his sons in and how he blessed them and how he blessed Jacob and what happened between a Jacob and Esau. You know the story. Old man Isaac outlived all the other patriarchs. And there he grew very old and lost his eyesight. But he was a good old man. You'll find where he did a lot of evil things like some in the Bible. And he loved the Lord. But his name was the Laughing One. They called him the Laughing One. They named him Laughter because his father laughed and his mother laughed. And his mother said the people would hear that I'm 90 and my husband's 100. I'm expecting a child and they'll laugh. And they laughed about that. And when this boy was born, God moved upon the scene for them to call him the Laughing One. And so he carried that name, Laughter. The name Isaac means laughter. If you have a child named Isaac, know someone that, that, uh, that's named Isaac, then that means laughter, the Laughing One. No reflection on the child, of course. But remember, that's the meaning of the name Isaac. Do you know Jesus Christ today as your own personal Savior? Have you been born again, washed in His precious blood? If not, you'll repent right now and turn to God. There may be some of you out in the radio listening audience. You have a burdened heart. Maybe you had a, a weekend night last night out in sin. Maybe you're greatly discouraged today. Things have gone wrong. Maybe your heart's sick, downcast. Maybe you're looking for a job or your health's gone bad. Have you ever thought about turning to God? If you don't turn to God and get saved, you'll die and go to hell. If you continue on like that. You need to repent right now and turn to God. And remember this. As you move toward the top of the hill with a heavy wood on your back, there's a little lamb coming up on the other side. And you'll meet him on the top of the hill one of these days. And he'll take your place. And die in your stead. God will solve your problem. At the top of the hill. So keep going. The wood gets heavy. Keep moving on. Keep moving on. You soon reach the top. The little lamb will be there waiting. When you get there. There's no problem too hard for God. There's nothing he can't do. Always remember that. As you sojourn. Thank you for listening well. Let's stand to our feet. Father I pray today. That you speak to the people here in the auditorium. I pray, dear God, you speak to the radio listening audience. I pray, Father, somebody might get saved today. I pray that many might be helped and strengthened. I pray, dear God, that your name might be honored and Jesus might be glorified. Thank you for the laughing one. He made a great impression upon the world. Thank you for his life and what he means to the people of God even this day. Thank you you gave him to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. Have your way in this invitation. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now Debbie's going to play. On the organ softly as she plays. There's somebody in this auditorium unsaved. Backslidden on God. Or you want to join the church. For any other reason you need to come forward. I want you to come. And let us help you while she plays. Would you come? The invitation is yours. I deliver the message. It's up to you to respond. Would you like for North Side to be your church home? Have you broken fellowship with God? Would you like to come back? Are you unsaved and like to get saved today? We're going to give you ample time to respond. Would you respond? How about it? Just a moment or so.